Hello, my name is Mary, and I'm coming to you from the children's room at the Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. We're celebrating Women's History Month by reading biographies, and today we have a biography about a beloved children's author, Beverly Cleary. The book is called Just Like Beverly, a biography of Beverly Cleary. It was written by Vicki Conrad and illustrated by David Hone. It was published in 2019 by Little Bigfoot, an imprint of Sasquatch Books. On a farm near Yamhill, Oregon, lived a girl named Beverly Bunn. She had no siblings and there were no other children nearby, so her playmates were farm animals. She fed baby birds, climbed trees, and followed horses around the fields. Beverly loved stories, but she had only two books. Her mother read them out loud over and over. Beverly was so starved for new stories, she made up her own. She made up stories about the fluffy yellow chicken in a magazine ad. She recited Goldilocks and the Three Bears over and over and dreamed up adventures about the Campbell Soup Kids. In Yam Hill, other children needed books too. Beverly's mother decided to start a children's library in town. When she asked the Yam Hill community for donations, a pile of adult books arrived. Where are the books for kids like me? Beverly wondered. Beverly's mother wrote an article for the newspaper about Yam Hill's need for books. To her surprise, crates of books arrived from the State Library of Oregon in Salem. 62 beautiful children's books in a cupboard in an empty room above the bank became Yam Hill's first children's library. Finally, Beverly had new stories. She sat on her mother's lap and listened to book after book. Fairy tales and Beatrix Potter stories about bunnies and squirrels were her favorite. When Beverly turned six, her family moved to Portland, Oregon. There she found playmates, neighborhood children just like her. They had games and toys, Parcheesi, Tinker Toys, Old Maid, and doll houses. Everyone owned roller skates, except Beverly. She sat on the front steps of her house, longing for her own pair. Her father came home from work one day with the perfect gift. At last, Beverly felt like part of the neighborhood, skating up and down the hills with skinned knees. Beverly and her friends had fun inventing games. They made perfume by pounding rose petals and soaking them in water. They played Brick Factory by smashing old bricks into dust with rocks. They clanked around on stilts made from coffee cans until they fell over laughing. To teach her to be graceful, Beverly's mother enrolled her in ballet. She danced around the studio, trying to learn steps that sounded like gallop and saute. Soon, it was time for Beverly to attend Fernwood Grammar School. Her father brought home two first grade readers. I'll teach you to read, her mother said. Beverly shook her head no. She wanted to learn at school. The first day at Fernwood was a blur of children. A whistle blew and everyone marched into class. Beverly pumped her knees and followed. Before lessons, 
The class sang about the Donzer Lee light. What kind of light is a Donzer? She wondered. Everything was strange to Beverly. The songs, the Pledge of Allegiance, the rules, the desks, all in a row. She felt small and nervous. Math lessons were easy for her. She could already add and subtract with real numbers, not counters. Her teacher, Miss Falb, never noticed. When Beverly wrote with her left hand, Miss Falb noticed. You must always hold your pencil in your right hand, she scolded. Now writing was painful and hard. Beverly began to read small words like mama, kitty, and see. Then Beverly got sick with smallpox. This was a serious sickness. A red sign on her lawn warned the neighbors and the milkman to keep away. Even her father had to leave until she was well again. When she returned to class, after weeks and weeks, reading was harder. Miss Fall was put everyone into reading groups. Bluebirds, redbirds, and blackbirds. The bluebirds were the best readers. The blackbirds, the worst. Beverly was assigned to the blackbirds. Beverly dreaded reading circle when each blackbird had to stand and read aloud. All eyes watched her struggle, her tongue tripping over the sounds. She hoped for easy words she already knew, like party and baby. As she stood for her turn, Beverly's stomach twisted and her voice was small as a mouse. Besides, the reading books were boring. The children in the stories never did anything interesting and they weren't funny like her friends. Tom and Pam go to the seashore, she read. Beverly knew everyone in Oregon went to the beach. No one said seashore. Where were the books about kids like her? Once, when Miss Falb caught Beverly daydreaming, she whipped her hands with a switch. The stinging was unbearable. Another time, she banished Beverly to the coat room. She sat on the floor and cried. School was not the happy place she had imagined. At the end of the year, Beverly's grades were bad, and she could barely read. All summer, she dreaded going back, worried she would have to repeat first grade with Miss Falb. But something wonderful happened the next year. Beverly went on to the second grade and got a new teacher. Miss Marius was patient and encouraging. Beverly, come to my desk with your book. Side by side, Miss Marius pointed to letters and hinted at their sound. Soon, Beverly could read every word. Finally, she was happy and confident at school. She was proud in a way she had never been before. She could read, but the books were too boring. So Beverly decided she would read only for Miss Marius, the teacher she loved. One day, Beverly's mother found a box of old books in a church basement and brought two home for her. I'll never read these, Beverly thought. But on a rainy day, a rainy, boring Sunday afternoon, she picked one up. Just to look at the pictures, it was called The Dutch Twins. Beverly read a few pages, then she read a few more pages, and a few more, and before she knew it, the whole afternoon was gone. At last, Beverly understood the magic of books. The children in the Dutch twins were just like her. They were funny and had adventures. She started the next book right away. 
for the first time ever, her mother put off bedtime. From that day on, Beverly was a reader. She endured the gloomy Oregon winters, curled up in the public library. Beverly's love of reading led to writing. A newspaper offered a free book to any child who wrote a review. Her mother suggested she try it. The newspaper gave her the story of Dr. Doolittle. They published her book review in the paper, along with her photograph. Suddenly, Beverly was the school celebrity. When Beverly was in fourth grade, the store across the street from school held an essay contest. The best animal essay would win a $2 prize. Beverly chose an excellent topic, the Oregon beaver, of course. Her father brought home green scratch paper from his job at the bank, and Beverly used it to write her essay. Beverly was nervous. So many of her classmates planned to enter, but she did her best and turned her essay in early. On the last day of the contest, she raced to the store. Beverly won. Mr. Abendroff handed her the prize money. She couldn't believe it. Two whole dollars. You were the only one who entered he said with a chuckle. Beverly was still thrilled. In fact, she learned a powerful lesson. Try. Anyone can talk about writing, but only those who sit down and do it will succeed. In seventh grade, Beverly wrote stories in her reading class. Her teacher, Miss Smith, was impressed. She read one of Beverly's stories out loud and announced, when Beverly grows up, she should write children's books. Beverly dreamed of being a writer. She even found the spot on the library shelf where her books would go one day. After finishing high school, she went to college in California. At a party, a kind man named Clarence Cleary asked her to dance. They soon became friends, and as college ended, Clarence promised to marry her. But Beverly needed to follow her dreams of becoming a librarian. So while Clarence stayed in California, she moved to Seattle to study library science at the University of Washington. Then she got a job as a children's librarian in Yakima, Washington. Beverly missed Clarence, but she loved her job. Once a week, a group of rowdy boys came in looking for books. She struggled to find something just right for them. One exasperated boy asked her, where are the, where are the books about kids like us? Beverly didn't have an answer. She thought about her own childhood reading boring books. She remembered how she longed for funny stories about children in her neighborhood. Children just like her. So with her first paycheck as a librarian, she bought a typewriter to write the stories she wished she'd had as a girl. But her librarian duties and writing letters to Clarence ate up all of her time. After a year, year, Clarence came to Yakima and surprised her with a ring. Beverly was overjoyed. They got married and moved to California where, staying true to her love of books, she worked as an army librarian and bookstore clerk. As Beverly's life changed, she still longed to write her own stories. One day, in the closet of their new home, she and Clarence found a ream of paper. I guess I'll have to write a book, joked Beverly. Why don't you? asked Clarence quite seriously. Beverly laughed. 
We never have any sharp pencils. The next day, Clarence came home with a present. Beverly remembered her lesson from the essay content test. She had to try. She was determined to write a story of her own. As she stared at the paper and the typewriter, she wasn't sure how to begin. Was it all a foolish dream? She thought about the boys at the library. She thought about her childhood, roller skating on Hancock Street. She would write the story she longed for as a child. Beverly remembered hearing a funny story about a boy and his dog riding the streetcar. She wrote her first sentence. Henry Huggins was in the third grade. What would I call the dog, she wondered. Glancing around the kitchen, it came to her. Spare ribs. Beverly completed her first short story, naming it Spare Ribs and Henry. She sent it off to publishers and waited. She checked the mail every day. Finally, a postcard came that read, your manuscript has been received. She kept waiting. Every afternoon for six long weeks, she trimmed the rose bushes in her yard, waiting for the mailman. Beverly explained she was waiting for good news. At last, the mailman came running. It's here, he called. Beverly celebrated with Clarence. Spare ribs became ribsy. And two years later, Henry Huggins became her first published book. It was a huge success. She wrote many more books inspired by her childhood. Each book was filled with characters who lived and played on Clickatat Street. Beverly's character, Ramona Quimby, loved playing Brick Factory, wearing coffee can stilts and roller skating. She wondered about the Donzerly light, just like Beverly. Henry Huggins was just like the boys who came into the library. Beverly Cleary, the struggling black bird reader, wrote more than 40 books for children. She became one of the most celebrated authors in the world by writing for children just like her. How Beverly bloomed. Beverly Atley Bunn was born on April 12, 1916 in McMinnville, Oregon. She lived on a farm in Yamhill, Oregon until she was six. She was able to run wild and free, but as an only child, she always dreamed of having siblings and playmates. Beverly's parents dreamed of escaping the struggle of farm life, so they moved their family to the big city, Portland, Oregon. The city was full of new experiences and different adventures for Beverly. She rode streetcars over the Willamette River. Their neighborhood was paradise. She had playmates, sidewalks for roller skating, and freedom to play all day long. The memories Beverly made during her elementary years would later become the material for the funny stories in the book she wrote. Her childhood struggles with learning to read and being forced to read boring books motivated her to write for children. As she overcame her difficulties with reading, Beverly's storytelling talent came to light. She had a gift that continued emerging as she got older. She began to write seriously in the seventh grade when a school librarian recognized her promise. The librarian, Miss Smith, also taught reading and writing. She was an unusual teacher because she encouraged students to be creative. During Beverly's school years, there were strict rules. No reading ahead, no reading for pleasure in class. When writing a paper, students were usually asked only to summarize their assigned reading. 
Miss Smith's assignments required imagination. When Miss Smith instructed her class to write a letter pretending they lived in George Washington's time, Beverly wrote about having to sacrifice a pet chicken to feed the troops at Valley Forge. Miss Smith praised Beverly by reading her letter out loud. And her classmates, who had been stumped for ideas, began writing copycat chicken stories. For the first time, she was allowed to use her imagination, and it felt glorious. Miss Smith's next assignment was to write about a favorite storybook character. Beverly couldn't think of just one, so she wrote a story about visiting all of her favorite characters in a place called Bookland. As she wrote on a rainy winter afternoon, the same magical peace came over her that she experienced when she first got lost in a book at the age of eight. She got lost in the wonder of writing. Beverly didn't think her story was superb. However, Miss Smith loved it and read it out loud, encouraging Beverly to write a children's book. Beverly was not used to being praised, especially in front of her peers. Those words were powerful, and they gave her a direction that she followed into adulthood. Beverly attended college from 1934 to 1938, in the middle of the Great Depression. Life was hard during this time. Few jobs were available, and money was scarce for most people. She depended on family to afford college and lived with her mother's cousin in Ontario, California for two years where she attended a junior college. She went on to attend the University of California at Berkeley. This was her dream school because of its graduate school of librarianship program. Beverly refused to be a financial burden on her parents. So she worked very hard through school to pay her own expenses. She babysat to earn extra money. When she realized her sewing skills were superior to that of her classmates, she began hemming their skirts for 50 cents a piece. Her gift for writing bloomed in her college years. An essay she wrote about her early reading experiences earned an A. The essay was so well written, her professor read it aloud in class. Without knowing it, Beverly had begin, begun to write the story of her life. Each week, Beverly attended dances at Berkeley. One evening, a kind young man who stood out from the rest asked her to dance. This is how she met her future husband, Clarence Cleary. They were close friends all through her college years, and the weekend of her graduation, he expressed his desire to marry her. But first, Beverly wanted to pursue a career. Her pursuit of this dream was shaped by her early school experience. Once she discovered a love of reading, Beverly wanted to surround herself with books and pass this love on to others. She wanted to write, but didn't believe she could make a living from it. After college, she returned to the Northwest to complete the librarianship program at the University of Washington in Seattle, while Clarence stayed in California. She soon realized that the best place in any library was the children's section. She also realized that cataloging was boring and not her natural talent. To Beverly, the library represented freedom. It provided a safe place where children were free to come and go, and they could discover the magic of books. Her first job was as a children's librarian in Yakima, Washington. Reading at story hour was nerve-wracking at first, but when she focused on the children's faces, her nerves went away. Once, on a school visit, she read, Horton hatches the egg, and a child laughed so hard he fell out of his chair. That's when she discovered the joy of sharing the right story 
with the right children. With her first paycheck, Beverly bought herself pajamas, underwear, and a typewriter to fulfill her dream of writing. She did not know what to write, so she read a lot of books and wrote many letters to Clarence in California. Beverly's parents did not approve of Clarence, but she married him anyway. He came to Yakima and surprised her with a ring. After they got married, they moved to California together. Clarence was the biggest supporter of Beverly pursuing a writing career. He encouraged her every step of the way. While living in San Francisco, Beverly worked at the Sathergate Bookshop. Selling children's books gave her a stronger drive to write for children. She felt that many books for children were dull, and the children were not drawn to the children's books. This inspired her to offer something better. Beverly began writing her first story about Henry Huggins, based on her childhood and her playmates in Portland on Hancock Street, where she grew up. Beezus and Ramona were smaller characters in the Henry and Ribsy series. She eventually expanded this girl's stories into her most famous series, the Ramona books. Her characters played the same games as Beverly and her friends. She thought about the story she wanted to read in her childhood as she wrote, and she took her mother's writing advice to keep it simple and make it funny. Five years after Henry Huggins was published, Beverly and Clarence had twins, Malcolm and Mary Ann. Beverly drew from their lives for writing inspiration. When her son had reading struggles, she created Ralph S. Mouse to help him read. After she watched Malcolm play with a handful of toy cards, she wrote The Mouse and the Motorcycle. During her long and successful career, Beverly has written more than 40 books. Her work has received 35 state awards, as well as many other honors, including the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award and the Newbery Medal. The lives of Beverly's ordinary characters resonate deeply with children across generations. In recognition of this, she was given the Library of Congress Living Legend Award in 2000 for her many outstanding contributions to children's literature. Also, on Beverly's 90th birthday, HarperCollins established National Drop Everything and Read Day in her honor. And April was declared Deer Month in 2013. That's Drop Everything and Read Month. Portland, Oregon honored its beloved author by creating the Beverly Cleary Sculpture Garden in Grant Park. Statues of Ramona Quimby, Henry Huggins, and Ribsy were built in Beverly's honor. The elementary school she attended and wrote about in her stories is now called the Beverly Cleary School. Beverly Cleary lives in Carmel, California, and celebrated her 100th birthday on April 12, 2016. And we have been reading Just Like Beverly, a biography of Beverly Cleary, written by Vicki Conrad, illustrated by David Hohn. It was published in 2019 by Little Bigfoot, an imprint of Sasquatch Books. And my name's Mary, and I'm coming to you from the children's room of the Portland Public Library.